In the last video, we talked about nobility during feudal times. In this video, we are going to look at the medieval castle. The castle is perhaps one of the most recognizable symbols of the Middle Ages. The first thing people want to see when they travel to Europe are the castles. They are some of the most visited attractions in Europe. Castles evoke all kinds of images. There is this idea of a castle perched up on a mountain, surrounded by fog. There is almost a mystical aspect to the medieval castle. But in reality, the castle served as an important military center, and later it became economic as well. Now, in the last lecture, I talked about how close villages were in proximity to the castle. And you can see that in this illustration right here. This is a German feudal castle. This was very typical of a feudal estate. So as you can see, the castle dominates the landscape and gave the warlord control of the surrounding lands. It was also a great symbol of the feudal lord's power. Now let's look at the progression of the castle from the earliest times in feudal Europe. The earliest style was called the Mott and Bailey. These early castles were almost entirely made out of timber. There would have been a wooden tower on top of the Mott, and the Mott is the mound of earth which you can see right here. Wooden palisades also encircled the complex. Now the grounds inside the palisades were called the Bailey, so that forms the other part of the Mott and Bailey. In the last lecture, we also talked about the breakup of the Carolingian Empire and the serious threats the Vikings and other groups posed all over Europe. So the castle was really a response to that. You needed to have some sort of defense against these fierce barbarian groups. And so feudalism and the castle developed together over time. As I mentioned before, these early structures were purely military complexes. Later, though, castles had many more functions. They became the primary residence for a noble and served as an important economic center. Eventually, there was a movement away from timber to stone. Stone became the default material of choice, especially as the tools and techniques improved for stone cutting. And obviously, stone gives you several advantages in terms of defense. The most important being it's more resistant to fire. If you take a look at this castle, it's on a hill that commands the entire countryside. And that was the most advantageous position to build a castle. And again, that was on a good position on top of a hill where you had good sight lines. This allowed you to see anything that approached from a distance. It also gave your archers a nice height advantage. Now let's examine the different parts of a castle. The first part, of course, was the bridge. Many times, half of the bridge was a fixed bridge, which you can see right here, and the other half was the drawbridge, and that connected to the castle itself. Under the bridge was usually a moat, and that was likely infested with all kinds of insects. Security at the castle would have been very strict. If you were not part of the garrison, you would have been required to check all of your weapons at the gatehouse. The gatehouse, of course, was the main entrance, and that made it one of the most vulnerable parts of a castle, since often it was the only opening. So this was usually the most heavily fortified part of a castle. At the gatehouse, a portcullis could be lowered in times of an attack. The portcullis controlled passage to the main gatehouse. It was not uncommon for a castle to have four or even five portcullises. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been to try and circumvent all of these defenses? And all the time, archers would have been firing down arrows and missiles at you. Now, key to the castle's defenses were guard towers and battlements. You can see the arrow slits on this guard tower that allowed archers to rain down arrows on would-be attackers. You can also see here that each corner is angled to give the archer a better firing position. Some guard towers were completely round. Defenders also could drop all sorts of objects, ranging from stones to boiling hot liquids and pretty much anything that might injure the attackers below. Now, here's a diagram of Pembroke Castle. Pembroke was a massive feudal stronghold in Wales. This diagram gives us a nice aerial look at a castle's defenses. You can see the main gatehouse right here. Here is the main guard tower. And the walls at Pembroke were 75 feet tall and 20 feet thick, which was typical of a feudal castle. Imagine trying to storm that. Also, many castles had multiple baileys, and usually that meant an outer bailey and an inner bailey. So if the attacker successfully took the outer bailey, there was still the inner bailey to deal with, and that meant having to take another heavily fortified point, the keep. So the center to the entire defensive system for a castle was the keep. These could be hundreds of feet tall, and they would have contained dungeons and sometimes even a well. 
and usually the keep had enough provisions inside to survive long sieges, perhaps for even years. The ground floor likely served as a storage space, because it had no windows. There were only a few open slits for air circulation. Nearly every keep had a great hall. Originally, everyone, including the Lord, would have lived in the hall. But eventually, as castles grew larger and larger, more and more rooms were added for private quarters. Great halls were increasingly used for public events. The Great Hall would have been the most impressive room in a castle, and many of these Great Halls had a massive fireplace. The Great Hall served many purposes, the first of which was eating. It also would have been the place for numerous ceremonies. The Lord would have sat on his throne chair, surrounded by members of his household and even court officials. So it not only served as a residence, but also was a place the Lord would have conducted whatever realm affairs demanded his attention. The banner with the noble's coat of arms would have been flown over the keep. Now there were several ways to take a castle. The first and most obvious was through negotiation. If the talks were successful, the siegers were expected to allow the castle's occupants safe passage. Another way was through treachery, and the idea here is to gain supporters on the inside, and then they can lead you through a secret passage where you could capture the main gate as fast as possible. Related to this was trickery, and this was one of the oldest ones in the book. Think of the Trojan horse in the Iliad. Still another way was to starve occupants out. And if all of these attempts failed, it became necessary to storm the castle. And of course, that involved siege equipment. Sieges were very tiring and costly, even to the attackers. And even if you gained entry, it didn't necessarily mean you could defeat the defenders. Now, for the army laying siege to the castle, they had access to a fantastic array of equipment. One of the simplest ways to storm a castle involved ladders, which you could use to try and scale the walls, but that usually involved taking heavy casualties. Battering rams could be used against the main gate or a portion of the wall, and the idea here was to rip down an entire portion of the wall so that your army could move in. Movable siege towers could also be deployed. The main advantage of the siege tower was height, and with that height, a bridge could be lowered right over the battlements. Attackers could then storm the battlements and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A battering ram might also be attached to the siege tower. Siege towers were usually one of the most expensive devices, so usually only wealthy nobles could afford them. One of the most widely used weapons in the history of siege warfare was the catapult. The catapult lobbed stones, but also it could be used to lob diseased carcasses in order to spread disease. So biological warfare was around even in those days. Eventually, as castles grew stronger, catapults became less and less useful and were replaced by the more powerful trebuchet which we'll talk about in the next slide. The other main siege weapon was the ballista. Ballista were essentially gigantic crossbows. The ammunition used were basically giant arrows, which were iron-tipped. These arrows were then shot along a flat trajectory at the target. Ballistas had great accuracy and were relatively easy to construct. The ultimate weapon of the Middle Ages was the trebuchet. This was a massive piece of equipment that was almost as powerful as the early cannons. It was also very accurate. The trebuchet lobbed massive stones that could take down an entire wall. The trebuchet had a huge range of around 250 to 300 yards, almost three football fields. Can you imagine that? It was almost like a gigantic sling. The trebuchet could not only heave stones, but also massive darts and even wooden poles. It also could be used to launch fireballs. Trebuchets, like many early siege weapons, were made of timber. So the defenders of a castle would make every attempt to set as many siege devices on fire as they could. Now, siege weapons were not the only tactic during the Middle Ages. Attackers could attempt to fill the moat with dirt and then build some sort of mound to storm the battlements. Also, mines could be dug in an attempt to collapse a particular wall or tower in the castle. This was far more effective against forts made out of timber because mining was less successful against castles made out of stone. Defenders also could dig countermines. From the countermine, the defenders could then dig into the attacker's tunnels and perhaps try to collapse their tunnel or set fire to it. Now, if the surrounding moat or lake was deep enough, it was almost impossible to dig a mine. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. In the next video, we will continue on with castles.